Hi, everyone. Thank you so much to coming out to this event tonight on such a beautiful evening. Um, we begin with the land acknowledgement because we're grateful to live on land that is the traditional and unceded territory of the Silho Okanagan people. Um, they've called Okanagan home for thousands of years. And we're also grateful to silk artists, performers, and musicians for inviting our community to participate in cultural events. This weekend, we're celebrating Ignite the Arts Festival. And there's an art and activism workshop uh, with all this collective on Friday. On Saturday, you can learn how to hand drum with three generations of the Jack family. And on Sunday at the Penticton Art Gallery, artist Levi Bent will talk about his paintings, Rad on the Res. Um, Sue is putting the link to the Ignite the Arts Festival, the weekend uh, page. Some things have a cost and some things are free, so you have to explore, but I, I think you pay for the weekend. Um, I'm Laurie Goldman, and I'm here with Sue Kirschman. We're the hosts for tonight and are on the board of First Things First Okanagan Climate Action. This is our 21st deep dive seminar, which we've been hosting monthly since 2020. We feature speakers who bring together different perspectives on climate solutions. And by learning together, we hope to build connections and gain insight into what we can accomplish here in the Okanagan Valley and further afield. Um, a few housekeeping uh, notes. Let me know in chat if you have any technical issues and I'll try to help you. Please keep yourself muted and your camera off if you don't wanna be on the recording because we are recording the webinar. And um, put your questions to the presenter in the chat. We'll try to get to all of them after his talk. The recording of this session will be sent to you as a link to our YouTube channel, along with interesting links that come up in the discussion. And now I'd like to pass the reins to Sue. Thanks, Laurie. When we talk about renewable energy, we generally think about solar and wind and perhaps tidal. Often overlooked is the ground beneath their feet, which is a vast thermal storage device. The term geothermal, which essentially means ground, geo, and heat, thermal, is used to describe a couple of different applications. The first one is conventional geothermal, also called deep geothermal. I'm just going to share my screen. I have a couple of little slides here. Good, coming along. Good, thanks. <laughs> yep. You've likely seen something like this in your past, back in your school days. It looks a little bit like an Easter egg, but it's a picture of the earth showing its molten core where the temperatures reach thousands of degrees Celsius. In geographic areas where the tectonic plates meet and the Earth's crust is relatively thin, some of this heat reaches the surface. Got a picture here from Iceland and you can see that the heat is being released as hot water and steam. These are thermal geysers. And similarly in New Zealand, especially around the area Rotorua, lots of geothermal activity with steam, hot brine, and in some cases, boiling mud. Um, geothermal heat can be captured and used to create electricity or to provide district heating for the homes and industries in that area. Um, this photo was taken in Iceland, and I have another one here from New Zealand. We won't be talking about deep geothermal tonight, but before I move on, I just wanted to mention that Western Canada has lots of potential for this type of geothermal. Western Canada has lots of highly porous rocks like sandstone and limestone, which allow not only oil and gas to be brought to the surface, but also geothermal brine. And there are currently three ge geothermal power pro projects being developed, one in northeastern BC, one in um, northern Alberta, and another in southeastern Saskatchewan. I'll put a couple of links to these um, afterwards into the chat in case anyone's interested in learning more about these projects or about deep geothermal in general. 
The second application of geothermal is called geoexchange or shallow geothermal. In this case, the earth is used as a battery rather than as a heat source. The ground absorbs heat from the sun and stores it year round at a near constant temperature. In, in most places on earth, if you go down two to six meters below the surface, the ground temperature is a constant 10 to 16 degrees year round. So shallow geothermal takes advantage of this near constant temperature by extracting heat from the ground and bringing it up into the home during the, um, sorry, during the winter for heating. And in the summer, the opposite happens with the heat being pushed back down into the earth as the house is cooled. Tonight, our guest presenter will explain the ins and outs of how these geo shallow geothermal systems work. I'll just end my, my show and stop sharing. And I'll introduce Jimmy. Jimmy Lease is the Director of Marketing and Business Development at Geotility Geothermal Installations in Kelowna. They are leaders in geothermal energy installation in Canada and the US. And we're very happy to have him here to share his knowledge and expertise. As Laurie said, if you have any questions for Jimmy, please just type them into the chat and we'll have a session of um, Q&A afterwards. So Jimmy, I will turn it over to you now and please go ahead. Thanks Sue, I appreciate that. Um, and great presentation yourself. That's, uh, that's a good explanation of geothermal versus geo exchange. So I appreciate that. Um, nice, thank you for the invite. Uh, and thanks for everybody for joining again. Yeah, I'm the Director of Marketing and Business Development for Geotility, we are based in Kelowna. Um, I'll dive into a bit of a, a background about who we are, but who I am as well. Uh, I've been with this company for um, on my 14th year now. Um, so I started off as a, in my early 20s um, and even late teens uh, working as a field installer um, here in the Okanagan. And then, um, yeah, in my early 20s, I moved to Vancouver and worked out of our Vancouver branch and spent many, many years working on our large commercial geo exchange sites throughout the lower mainland and Vancouver Island, spent about six or seven years in the field. From there, uh, moved into a more of an estimating role directly for our Vancouver branch. Um, and progressively as the years have, have gone on, um, moved more into business development for both branches, uh, Kelowna and Vancouver, and now progressively moving into business development and marketing for all three of our branches as we also have one in Seattle. So. That's a bit of a background on myself. I have uh, a lot of field experience and, and um, you know, now building, estimating and, and, and marketing experience for our businesses. Um, so I'm just going to share screen as well and go over a PowerPoint. There's going to be a couple rep repetitive slides because, Sue, that was some great stuff that you just shared. So some of it's going to look a little bit the same, but that's, that's good. We can kind of chat about it. So can everybody see my screen now? Yes, looks good. Perfect. Okay. So again, um, just to kind of start from the beginning of who we are in our group of companies, uh, Geotility is our, our parent company and our construction company. So um, Geotility at its core, we're a fully integrated uh, geothermal and mechanical contractor based out of the Okanagan. We have three locations, one in Kelowna, one um, in Vancouver, and one in Seattle. So we work all throughout Western Canada and uh, into the United States as well. Um, Geotility itself, again, it's a fully integrated company. So we have four full-time in-house engineers. So we concentrate um, from the bottom up when it comes to uh, mechanical systems. Um, we have the ability and capability to do design build for um, not only geo exchange ground loops, um, but interior mechanical systems as well. So we have a commercial and residential sector of, of geotility. Um, our commercial side, we have our own fleet of drill rigs in-house, so we do not subcontract that out. Um, so we have all of our own custom-made drill rigs for geo exchange drilling only. We're not water well drillers um, that occasionally do geothermal drilling. Um, we are specifically built for the industry that we are in. Uh, so all of our installers and all of our equipment is in-house. Uh, for large commercial projects. And then on the residential side, we do a large variety of projects. Um, we have a sheet metal fabrication shop here in the Okanagan. 
Uh, we do all our own heat pump installations. Uh, we have hydro a full hydronics team, uh, refrigeration team, and technicians, and 24-hour service team uh, for multi-family, single-family uh, residential communities and developments um, throughout Western Canada as well. So that is our parent company. Um, on top of that, so uh, the ownership group uh, about 18 to 20 years ago realized that um, geothermal, which we'll dive into here shortly in the presentation, was a, it is a, a, an additional cost to construction. So they wanted to find a way to implement um, geothermal in more multifamily and master plan communities. So they started TerraSource, which is a geothermal utility service. Uh, so TerraSource uh, partners with developers um, and builders in communities where we we stat we register statutory right of ways and covenants on the land, just like any other utility company, just like a Fortis or a BC Hydro would. And we put up the capital. We own and we install, own and operate geothermal systems for uh, homes throughout uh, developments, and then um, charge a monthly utility fee for the. Uh, Earth's energy, essentially, just as Fortis would do for gas. Uh, and the reason for that was, again, because, you know, developers for many, many years and still do, they want to implement geothermal in their communities, but it does come at an added expense. Um, so this is a way for us to partner up and um, push the technology a little bit more. So that's our Canadian utility company. And then we also have Orca Energy, which is the same platform, same operation type, just different name based throughout the, the United States. Um, so I'll show some projects uh, that all three of our sort of group of companies have done in the past. So just a little bit about geot geotility. Again, we've been installing geothermal for over 30 plus years. So um, I'm actually born and, and raised in this company. My father's the founder uh, and CEO of geotility. Um, originally before it was geotility, it was called Leaskin Sons, which is my last name, uh, which was started by my father, his brother and my grandfather. Um, the three of them started with sheet metal fabrication and plumbing many, many moons ago. So I'm third generation into the mechanical industry. Uh, but in the late 80s and early 90s, uh, my father traveled over to Europe and uh, saw, more specifically Germany, and saw that geo exchange was quite popular. Uh, so when he came back uh, to Kelowna, where where he's he's been living for many decades, uh, implemented his first geothermal project in 1989, actually. Um, and since then, we've installed well over 20,000 tons of geothermal systems throughout Western Canada and the U.S. Um, again, to, to repeat myself, we have professional engineers on staff. We are Canada's largest fully integrated geothermal contractor. So um, we, we specifically uh, built our company on design and making sure that um, the design and engineering is a very key and vital role um, when it comes to installing these projects. So we have in-house engineers, um, largest comprehensive contractor. We have over 4 million of feet, feet pipe installed, and we've operated our geotility service for about 18 to 20 years now, sorry, not 15. So TerraSource, we build, own, and operate and maintain geothermal systems. And uh, this goes to the same for Orca Energy as well. We fund 100% of the infrastructure costs. So this is something that developers can market and sell geothermal within their communities uh, at no additional cost themselves. The users pay a monthly fee. Uh, we structure this not on usage. So um, it's, it's actually by tonnage of the heat pump and it's in, and we set our rates by CPI. So our months can, or our rates cannot fluctuate month by month or year by year. Um, it can only get raised by CPI annually. Um, and our we have utility customers throughout uh, Western Canada and the United States, and then uh, vast experience working with developers, builders, and homeowners. And we've been operating our utility services for many years as well. Um, again, TerraSource, we design, build, own, and operate geothermal infrastructure. So um, I wanted to sort of dive a little bit into who we are and our types of companies first before we did the Geothermal 101 um, and give you some background on that. But one thing that's really helped us and, and um, implemented our technology throughout uh, the Okanagan where we started was this utility infrastructure program. Uh, we partnered with what, what Scott TerraSource started originally was uh, the Wilden development. If, if some of you are locals to Colonia, you may know it well. I actually live in Wilden myself. Uh, it's a beautiful neighborhood. So when Wilden was first getting started, the, um, the developer and owner of the land was really sustainable forward. Uh, he was forward thinking within his community. He wanted to keep you know kilometers of green space. Um, and since then his daughter has taken over the company and 
she is continuing down that path. Um, so TerraSource was formed mainly for uh, this community. And uh, since then, it has really grown into a full-blown uh, utility company. And we partner with many large developers throughout the Okanagan. So TerraSource funds 100% of the infrastructure. Again, no capital required. Um, users pay that monthly fee to TerraSource. So there are many different structures and programs that can be set up, whether it's through the stratas with um, uh, townhouse developments, duplex developments, or single family master plan communities. Um, TerraSource is able to structure uh, rates uh, dependent on those communities. So we secure the rights and easements and, and other covenants that may be required similar to any other utilities. And we make an agreement originally with the developer that get, then gets uh, presented to different stratas and, and homeowners when they're coming into a, a community such as Wilden. Uh, we are solely responsible as per any other utility company for ongoing maintenance uh, infrastructure, all the design engineering and installation and operation of our utilities. So um, our capabilities, again, engineering, we do a lot of feasibility studies throughout Western Canada. Um, so a lot of schools, all of school district 23 uh, now implements geo exchange technologies within all of their new schools. They've been doing that for almost 10 years now. Um, and when you get into the larger geo exchange type projects, uh, a lot of feasibility studies are done or formation thermal conductivity tests, where we'll go and drill one hole, um, which will analyze, uh, do an investigation onto the geology, some different, uh, some areas have different ge geologies. So up here in Wilden, we find a lot of bedrock, um, whereas in Richmond in the lower mainland, it can be sandstones or just sands, um, silts and cobbles. Um, we've drilled all around, but with larger geo exchange projects, we'll want to go in and actually do an individual ground loop uh, where we drill the hole, install it as if it was to be operational. And then we bring in a formation thermal conductivity test unit where we run a life cycle um, and conductivity uh, study uh, for 48 hours and, and go through a feasibility study within that uh, exact site so we can be as specific as possible with our design. Um, we work directly in project development as well. So when developers are rezoning, uh, going through their development permits and, and building permits, um, we are usually involved from the very beginning with our feasibility studies and our project development. We have in-house uh, project management and all of our construction is in-house as well. So um, I will show you a little bit later, but there are different types of geo exchange fields. So as Sue did mention um, geo exchange is the technical word for what we do uh, or shallow grade geothermal. Um, geothermal is uh, technically a deep grade uh, steam sort of energy drilling uh, for large scale projects. Um, geo exchange, which is what we specify, but majority of the people within our industry just use the term geothermal. Um, we are more for space heating and cooling of residential and commercial applications. So that is mainly what we do. Um, and then with geo exchange fields, there are two types of fields, so vertical and horizontal, um, which you'll see some examples later on, but uh, vertical is essentially vertical drilling, so a series of boreholes, whereas horizontal, um, you can actually lay uh, horizontal pipe networks underneath uh, if you have a large property uh, acreage or if you're building a school underneath the soccer pitch, um, we can install horizontal piping, which does the same, uh, same thing as any sort of type of vertical drilling just with, with a much larger footprint. On top of that, we have the ability to install pipe thin piles, so structural piles. We do this quite often in the Richmond, Kawasin, uh, and Lower Mainland areas where you're already drilling for piles. We can actually install pipe within the rebar cages um, and pull energy from the ground with those. So there's different applications. We do not specifically work with open loop systems, but there is that uh, possibility um, within geo exchange systems as well which are very popular in the Chilliwack and Abbotsford area. Um, we work with the developers a lot on financial modeling. And then again, our in-house drilling, fusion and mechanical system installations. Uh, we have a large amount of marketing expertise and implementation of other technologies. Uh, we work in conjunction with sewer heat recovery, solar, or more specifically photovoltaic um, panels uh, pair up with our systems very, very well. So a bit of geothermal 101, what is it? So it's heating and cooling method that utilizes the constant temperature of the earth, eliminating the use of fossil fuels um, and reduces greenhouse gases, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So 
Um, essentially, geothermal or geo exchange systems transfer heat from the ground into the home, um, like Sue was saying earlier. So we're, we're really just moving energy. We're not creating heat energy. We're moving energy from the ground um, via a series of pipe networks and pumps within the home. Um, and that heat exchange system uh, consists of that underground piping that circulates fluid through the ground and then into the home, uh, which you'll see on the next slide. There are three primary components of a geothermal system. The ground heat exchanger, which is your ground loop, is what we may call it, or underground series of piping. On the inside, you will find a heat pump. Um, this would be very similar to the size or, or look of a gas furnace or maybe an air source heat pump, which sits outside, but that is your interior mechanical equipment. And then from there, you have your distribution system as you would in any typical home. So whether that's forced air ductwork, uh, hydronic heating uh, through radiant in floor or fan coils of that sort. So uh, as you can see, here's a little bit of a visual. So we, if this was a vertical application or horizontal application, you had you were essentially your heat pump sits inside your home, and that's the wonderful thing about uh, geothermal systems versus air source, um, is your heat pump's going to sit inside the mechanical room, uh, so the longevity of that heat pump is much longer. But first is your underground pipe network, whether that's vertical or horizontal. As the water circulates, it collects the heat energy from the ground. Um, and, and connects back to the heat pump inside the home. And then there, inside that heat pump, there's a small compressor um, or heat exchanger that will then turn that into um, a forced air or inflow radiant or hydronic heating and cooling, whatever it may be inside your home or commercial application. So again, it reduces your greenhouse gas emissions by completely eliminating fossil, fuel, fossil fuels, which is the wonderful part of um, electrification and geothermal. The operation efficiencies of geothermal versus natural gas um, furnaces or boilers are three to 500% more efficient than your conventional gas furnaces. Uh, and your typical air source heat pump, if you're looking at electrifying with an air source heat pump is usually about two to 300%. So we're 100 to 200% more efficient than an air source heat pump because it's not working uh, on the exterior of your home. So air source heat pumps do have to heat your home in the winter and they are struggling on the outside of your home um, or in the summer in the extreme heats at the same time they're trying to cool your home and, and they're dealing with the outdoor elements. So they're moving heat and cooling energy. They do not create it. Uh, we do rely 100% on solar thermal energy, which is absorbed by the ground uh, and is kept at a steady temperature of about 57 degrees Fahrenheit or 10 to 14 degrees Celsius, depending on the areas. Um, and, and the wonderful thing about geothermal is it eliminates your outdoor equipment and is 100% renewable. It, it relies 100% on electricity. Um, so... What is the reasoning and why do we choose geothermal? So there are many different benefits to choosing geothermal. Uh, the homeowner benefits are um, a lot of lifestyle um, benefits. So you remove all of your outdoor equipment. So your systems are a lot quieter. You have much better airflow because the heat pumps are sitting comfortably inside your home. Um, they are not uh, using any sort of combustion to create um, create heat energy. Um, so the better airflow, better comfort and no fossil fuel combustion. So it's a safer, cleaner, um, way of, of air movement rather than having any sort of burn off of gas within your home. There are many financial benefits, um, outside of, you know, the additional cost for the infrastructure, um, terror source, there is no upfront cost, which is, is great. Uh, there is a lower long-term life cycle cost. Uh, so the efficiencies in the summer and winter, um, are really beneficial and your, your operational costs will go down. Um, in the shoulder months, they're about the same as an air source heat pump, uh, where you really start to see your savings are the summer and winters. We have found, uh, we've done studies here in Wilden where we've had properties assessed. Um, Wilden did a, a net zero study where one home had a gas furnace and one home had a geothermal heat pump in it. We put an energy monitor in. So we do have data that shows um, the, the efficiency rates of our heat pumps versus a gas furnace. And we've had a real estate agent assess the homes. Um, and they did determine that, you know, when you remove the outdoor equipment, um, that equipment is going to have less operational costs, less repairs down the road. Uh, it does increase the, the home value. Um, and you have long-term energy cost stability, which is wonderful. So um, on the environmental side, renewable energy source for all your heating and cooling, Geo Exchange has the ability to um, heat your domestic hot water, supplement some pools, 
um, and other other types like that as well, uh, while all while us using renewable energy sources. And then it eliminates, which is very important, the burning of fossil fuels, which, um, as we all know, is a very important thing. Um, it is more efficient, and the equipment typically lasts longer. Um, it might last much longer than a gas furnace, and it out outlives an air source heat pump by about five to eight years minimum, is what we're finding, even up to 10 to 15 years, depending on the system. So, um, again, here's a little bit of a lifestyle benefit. The nice thing is, is you're removing all your outdoor uh, condensers. So for homeowners, um, especially in the lower mainland, where the light, the lots are very tight, um, you you get to remove all of your cooling um, air source heat pumps or air handling units from outside. From the developer's standpoint, and um, this is kind of more focused on TerraSource, um, there is no cost to the developer. So they have the ability to market and sell their community um, as a geothermal community with no additional cost when they partner up with TerraSource. Um, they do provide renewable energy throughout their community as well. Uh, which is wonderful. It helps them hit their step code targets. Um, there's a lot of requirements coming into these municipalities. There's already requirements in the city of Vancouver. Uh, they ban natural gas in Metro Vancouver for all, um, all buildings from one to three stories uh, for space heating and cooling and domestic hot water. So uh, a lot of these townhouse developments are now having, they have to go either air source or geothermal. Um, and for developers uh, where they do not have a lot of space for townhomes, uh, those units have to go in the front door or the back door or on the rooftop patio, whatever it may be. Um, so they have the ability to remove all the downsides of an air source heat pump by installing geothermal at no additional cost. Uh, again, developers really like it because they are able to reduce or eliminate their carbon footprint, at least for the space heating and cooling. And um, they, they're able to partner with us as a, an industry leader uh, in geothermal design and construction. Uh, we work really hard with a lot of different developments and communities on education, marketing, uh, training for not only their, their construction teams, their sales teams, but the homeowners that are buying it within uh, their communities as well. So we're very hands-on um, with, you know, a perfect example is Wilden, but we, um, we work hard at creating some marketing material as well. So um, these developers aren't on their own. So a little bit of an example of some stuff that we've done with uh, Orca Energy. Uh, we do a lot of different pieces of, of marketing, whether that be on social media or building up some website content, uh, whatever it may be for, for developers. Moving on, a bit of a construction comparison. Some people <clears throat> think if they are installing a heat pump or a geothermal heat pump, um, it may not work with the system that they do have within their home. Um, so geothermal heat pumps will connect to any distribution system and work with pretty much every distribution system of heating and cooling that you would have other than electric baseboards. So again, we have the ability to provide forced air heating and cooling, inflow radiant, all that sort of stuff. So with your traditional gas furnace, you're going to have your furnace, your air conditioner, which sits outside. Um, your venting materials, all your gas lines, your refrigeration lines, refrigerant lines, um, and your electrical lines that run outdoor to your AC unit. And outside, you will have your condenser, your pad for the outdoor equipment, and your electrical wiring and weatherproof uh, disconnect for the AC unit. Whereas when you move with a geothermal system, inside you just have one ground source heat pump that's in one box that does your heating and cooling. Um, it does have the ability to put a D superheater on there, which can uh, supplement your domestic hot water and a small little pump or flow center within your mechanical room um, that connects the ground loop to the heat pump. And that is it. There is no outdoor equipment. Um, all of the infrastructure is buried underground, uh, which is wonderful. So you get to eliminate a lot of that outdoor nuisance. The geothermal, co geothermal construction process is fairly simple. A lot of the times we, I'd say about 90% of the work that we do is new construction. Um, so we will mobilize our equipment, usually during the foundations and footing stages of um, the, the residence or the home. And um, your typical, your typical 2,500 square foot home might have two to three boreholes. Um, each borehole takes about a day to drill themselves or a little less than a day. So I'd say our, our rigs are on site for maybe two to three days. Um, once those vertical boreholes are installed, they do need to be connected with horizontal piping and buried uh, from four feet from finished grade. So if we were to drill those boreholes in the driveway area, there's a small amount of trenching that gets done 
um, for your below grade header. Um, usually that's done when all the other services are being brought onto site. Those are all fusion welded, so there are no moving parts underground. It's all HDP piping, high density polyethylene pipe. Um, that's all pressure test uh, to three times its operating pressure and hydrostatically test before we even allow it to be backfilled. Um, once it's, and that takes about a day, maybe two days to install that side of things. So all in all, you're looking at about four or five working days um, for drilling uh, and lateral piping installation, which then gets stubbed into the mechanical room of the home. Once that's buried, essentially, you never see it again. Uh, for us, then we move into the interior where we would install um, the heat pump and flow center. And from there, you connect either your forced air distribution or your hydronic systems um, and bring that throughout the home as per any other sort of construction process. And then at the very end, we make sure that it's flushed. Uh, the ground loop needs to be flushed and purged of all its air. There is a 20% sort of propylene glycol mixture. Since it's operating at different temperatures, um, it does get below freezing sometimes. So the propylene glycol is just essentially an antifreeze for the water running through the pipe. Uh, and then the heat pump gets started up and you are able to heat and cool your home through that one box uh, through the geo exchange system. So here's some examples, I guess. Uh, our, our rigs are custom built, like I said at the very beginning, for geothermal drilling. So we do not use water well rigs um, and do this every once in a while. This is, we have uh, over 60 full-time staff between our branches and we specifically concentrate on the technologies that we work with. Um, they're very small drill rigs in, when you're really considering uh, drilling. They fit on a, we, we built them on a Ford F-550 footprint. Um, and then we also have track rigs, which were even smaller. So we do in, in the lower mainland, we do a lot of large scale high rises where we can actually crane them in um, to the critical path of buildings, you know, in the P7, P8 uh, excavation level and drill within the footprint of the building. And then as you can see, we have one of our guys tying in that below grade header, which would then get stubbed into the mechanical room over here. And then from there, it connects to a flow center that then that that marries up between the heat pump and the ground loop, that flow center and circulates, circulates the fluid between the fields. So I wanted to show you guys a little bit of uh, some of our flagship projects before I show you some of the communities and, and some projects here locally. Um, I think it's always kind of fun to, you know, we're noticing a, a lot of trends that are starting to make their way up from the United States. And it's always nice to see some cool projects um, done by a local clone company. So Red or Microsoft, um, which is based there, their home base is uh, Redmond, Washington. Um, they had, they set a target and an aspiration a few years ago that uh, by 2030, they wanted to be a carbon negative um, company. So they've started to retrofit and rebuild all of their office space. It's going to take years and years, but they wanted to, uh, they've set a very hefty goal. Um, their main campus, which is in Redmond, Washington, our office is in Seattle. So it's not too far from our head office or one of our offices in Seattle. Um, they were they wanted to redevelop their 100 plus acre Redmond campus, um, and to do so and to create a carbon negative campus, um, they had to find some of the most efficient technologies for heating and cooling this campus. Um, and all roads led to geo exchange and a geo exchange district energy system. So in really large scale communities, we um, we analyze and look at district energy systems. So there's a way to share. Uh, heating and cooling. When you have multifamily townhomes per se, we'll drill individual boreholes for each home uh, because everybody's calling for heating at the same time or everybody's calling for cooling at the same time. Whereas campuses like this Microsoft one and others, um, you can actually share the energy and it becomes two to three or four times more efficient of a system um, because some areas will be calling for heating and cooling at the same time. If you have commercial space or gyms or offices uh, mixed with residential, um, district energy becomes very, very efficient and popular. So you'll hear that term used quite often in our industry. Um, so Microsoft looked at a campus-wide district energy system uh, featuring a large geothermal field. So this is the largest uh, geo exchange field, at least in the Western United States, um, if not all of the United States. Uh, we've drilled 900 boreholes to 550 feet deep each. Uh, so we, this, and this is just one half of their campus at the moment. Um, they're starting the other half, um, I think in 2024. So Geo Utility actually was uh, one of three contractors in North America who were even allowed to tender the Geo Exchange um, scope of work and, and we were awarded it, which is really wonderful. So 
some of the largest um, HDP uh, geo exchange piping you'll see running throughout any system, uh, 16 inch diameter HDP mains. Um, and the result is Microsoft is able to achieve their, their zero carbon heating and cooling solution for over 3 million square feet of commercial space um, throughout this campus. Here's a really cool sort of video. So as you can see, this is, so this is sort of the, the Redmond campus as it looked before. You'll see my cursor circle around it. The second phase on the other side of the highway is just over here, which will be starting in 2024. It's a little bit smaller, um, but this is a cool kind of video that shows you shows what uh, Microsoft has built and is building to this day. So again, you know, cool, cool little visual. Um, and here's another rendering of the Microsoft campus once it's all complete. So our field was, we finished our drilling and lateral pipe install, I think in about, uh, about eight months ago on site. Uh, so the first phase is now complete. Another one a little closer to home that our Vancouver branch is taking care of. So Lulu Island uh, District Energy System, which is based on Richmond, BC. Um, Geotility has worked very closely with the city of Richmond. The city of Richmond has been um, a huge push pusher of geo exchange for the past decade. Um, they've actually, you know, they've, they've really been on the forefront of creating this energy and implementing this technology. Um, they wanted to be the first municipality to own and operate uh, their own geothermal district energy system in BC, um, which they now are. So we helped them uh, create a low carbon district energy system for uh, an area in Lulu Island or um, in the Lulu Island area of Richmond, which is only a few minutes away from our office. So they have a central plant uh, featuring a large geo exchange field. We have about a thousand boreholes um, in that, uh, in that geology, we drill them to about 250 feet deep each. Um, so they have a mix of a geo exchange field and cooling towers with some backup boilers. Um, and these, these geothermal fields have been drilled in about two to three phases now over the past eight years. Uh, when I was a kid, about 20 years old, I used to actually drive from Kelowna to, to Vancouver to help our Vancouver team install this project. Uh, the buildings have a variety of mechanical systems throughout them. There's a mix of uh, commercial uh, commercial space. There's a Walmart, a shopping center, um, a small strip mall, and then there's about a thousand um, condos and townhomes attached to this district energy system um, within Richmond, which is wonderful to see. Next to this uh, site that we're currently on, and it's absolutely stunning. If you, if you guys ever have more questions about this, I'm, I'm happy to send some more information as well. There's some really cool links. So Oak Ridge redevelopment. So the Oak Ridge Mall has kind of been a staple, uh, big mall within the Vancouver area. Um, the developer called West Bank many years ago bought that land and, and they've, been, uh, they've been kind of working uh, in preliminary design for about 10 years. And they started construction about two years ago on the Oak Ridge Mall redevelopment, uh, or Oak Park is what they're like, liking to call it. So um, they wanted to implement a low carbon energy solution that serves over four and a half million square feet of residential and commercial space. So they are actually building nine or 10 high rises all at the same time. Um, which it's there, there's over 2,800 construction workers on site at any given day uh, on this Oak Ridge site. Um, it's, it's one of the largest geothermal fields within the lower mainland that's ever going to be installed. And we're currently, we've been drilling for about a year straight there now as well. So we're drilling in the critical footpath or footprint of this, this building. Um, and we've been engaged as the construction contractor for design assist role. And uh, the central geothermal field is sort of an anchor district energy system for all of the residents and commercial lease space that's going to be attached to the new Oak Ridge redevelopment. So this is a super cool project. We're very, very proud to be a part of it. Um, and I think last but not least, the Lucas Museum of Narrative Art. So this is uh, George Lucas, the, the um, founder of Star Wars. Him and his wife have um, over a billion dollar art collection. Um, and as locals to the LA area, they wanted to create um, a long lasting sort of community center for um, families and, and young ones around um, downtown LA, where they can learn and be as artistic as possible. So they, um, they started designing and building the Lucas Museum of Narrative Art. Um, so the owner, uh, Lucas Group, strives to create a world-class facility using energy-efficient solutions. This is essentially a spaceship uh, in downtown LA. It's very cool, with over 700 boreholes um, drilled within the critical path 
our Seattle group uh, was awarded and, and we we're complete by a couple of years on this project. The project itself is still under construction. I think it's set to um, to have its grand opening in 2024, which we're kind of excited to join in on. Here's a really cool sort of rending, rendering of the Lucas Museum and then some oversight of, of what the, the site looks like. Uh, in Hotel Georgia, this is a retrofit building. So there is the ability to retrofit uh, historical buildings and homes uh, with GeoExchange applications. So we actually um, drove a rig down to the uh, existing P7 Parkade and drilled in the footprint of the building. And there's some luxury high rises that are next to the Hotel Georgia. There's been many other projects that have been done like this since. Um, one Beverly Hills, which is another wonderful project happening in, in Los Angeles which I'll kind of skip through because there's a lot of a lot of projects. So some other local projects that you would see, um, again, Wilden, where I live in, there's over 700 homes on geothermal. I think there's over 2,000 homes built within the Wilden area. Now I'm not exactly sure if that's the right number, but it's got to be close. Um, located on bedrock, each home has an individual ground loop uh, out of each of those 700 homes. Um, lots of different townhouse developments within the lower mainland, 109 townhomes in Richmond, which we just completed. Um, some in Lake Country, Cadence at the Lakes, and who knows, maybe maybe one of you guys live in one of these neighborhoods. Um, Apex at the Lakes, which is its sort of neighboring development. Another one in Vancouver, BC, um, Northview, which is in Richmond, BC, Wembley. Uh, this is one of our energy pile projects that's currently going on in Richmond. So um, in the Richmond area, there's there's this multifamily condo development, and they need to put in 50 to 60 foot structural piles. Um, and our engineers were able to design uh, pipe systems that are put in the rebar cages um, and strapped into those rebar cages. So when they're installed, they're not only structurally holding the building together, but they're collecting energy from the ground at the exact same time and in a way to um, provide renewable energy to that development. So we're trying to implement this technology a little bit more. It's very, very cool. We've done it at the WestJet headquarters in Calgary and quite a few projects in the lower mainland. It hasn't quite caught up here. Um, here's an example of a horizontal field. So we do this for a lot of schools when they have uh, soccer fields that they're building up. Um, we're able to essentially just lay pipe uh, down underneath the soccer fields. Um, so there's a lot of schools, all, like I said earlier, School District 23 is all geothermal now. Um, a lot on Vancouver Island, the city of Burnaby is essentially looking at moving over to full geothermal on their projects. Um, and this is a very inexpensive way of implementing the technology. So if you have an acreage, uh, we're able to look at horizontal fields as well for your home. Um, Finch Drive, so net zero, uh, this is going to be Squamish's first net zero, full, fully net zero community. Um, so they have over 40 townhomes and 200 condo uh, units that are going to be going in here. We're just starting drilling this year. And um, the city of Squamish is a municipality that's extremely forward thinking. Um, and they're providing a lot of incentive to developers to either get to net zero um, or implement technology such as, uh, such as ours. So um, this is a wonderful sort of uh, partnership in conjunction with TerraSource that we're starting up on. Um, Finch Drive is a beautiful development that's just getting started, so that's great to see. Uh, Mixed-use commercial project in Langford, BC, uh, some condos in Victoria, and some other ones in Maryland. I'll kind of skip through these because these are sort of our U.S. ones, but it's kind of cool to see Orca. Uh, we work in, in Georgia and in Maryland, um, Adams Crossing in Denver. This is a full net zero community with over 500 acres um, in Denver, Colorado. Um, so they're they're actually going to be fully, they're collecting their water, uh, which is net zero. They're, they're going to have community gardens um, with enough agriculture to provide the, the calorie intake of 50% of their community, which is pretty cool. Um, Middlebrook Farms, this one's in Des Moines, Iowa. Um, this is another sort of agrohood. So a lot of these communities in the U.S. are really concentrating on agricultural cultural needs along with heating and cooling needs. So not only is geothermal going to provide the heating and cooling for all of the residents and, and commercial space, um, they're actually going to have large pockets of farmland within the community and gardens uh, for the community members to uh, not only plant and, and grow their, their own agricultural um, food, uh, but then farmers can sell within the markets within this community as well. So it's, it's a really cool development and a lot of communities in the United States are actually starting to move forward with this type of structure. Um, Sarin B, which is in Georgia. Um, and we'll kind of move in to finish it up and some recent trends that we've noticed. So electrification has been happening all throughout the United States for quite some time now. 
Um, the city of New York actually, or yeah, the city of New York banned natural gas about five years ago. Um, Beacon City and San Francisco and San Jose did the same. Um, and, and from there, other major cities have been doing that in the United States. And, and you know, uh, now some major cities here in Canada are starting to implement the same thing. So as I said, Vancouver has banned natural gas for one to three story buildings. Squamish is starting to incentivize banning natural gas within their communities, um, along with, you know, cities of Kimberley and, and Canmore and, and on the island. Um, we're seeing a lot of large um large companies like Microsoft, Google, Amazon, and Netflix has now approached us for their new campuses uh, where they want to be carbon free for all their mechanical uh, systems. Um, carbon taxes are obviously increasing, which is a bit of a burden, but this is a way to um, reduce or remove that, that burden. Uh, and governments are starting to accelerate their electrification programs. Uh, buildings are moving towards uh, true net zero or you know, step code four or five. Um, if you had a step code one home and you put geothermal within it, it immediately puts you at step code three. Uh, so geothermal is a really good way to get you up that step code ladder very quickly. Um, and then in the United States, which unfortunately it's not here yet in Canada, fingers crossed it starts to get implemented soon. Um, but there are already 30 to 40 percent geo exchange tax credits. Um, both federally um, and throughout different states. So if you were to install a geothermal field, um, you were to get a 30% uh, federal tax credit. Um, and then if you were to install a geothermal heat pump, you can get a 30 to 40% tax credit um, back as well. So geothermal systems are actually cheaper in the United States right now. So it's it's really, really moving quickly uh, for developments um, and, and Orca Energy um, in the US. And, and we're hoping that trend catches on up here uh, in the future as well. So we'll see electrification really happen in the US about five years ago, and we're starting to see it here now. So hopefully within the next few years, we start to see that same, that same thing get implemented. So that's about it for, for me, guys. Hopefully I kept it within the the 20 ish minutes. Um, I guess I'll maybe stop sharing now and, and see if Sue or Lori, if you guys have any questions that you've seen. Yes, uh, we have. Yeah. That was so great, Jimmy. We have lots of questions that have come in. And uh, I, I'm amazed and impressed with uh, the amount of work that you guys are doing. Um, I'll get right to the questions. Um, one person says, I understand the developer model when you're starting from scratch and serving many homes, but how cost effective is it to convert a single family home from gas to heat pump? Is that, is that possible? And also somebody else asked, um, is it possible to do um, anything DIY? Yeah, two good questions. Um, so retrofitting, uh, converting um, a current home, it is possible. Uh, absolutely. Now, it does come with a, some added financial burden. Unfortunately, um, there are many different, it's kind of a case dependent sort of question, which is a difficult one. Generally speaking, it can be quite become quite costly because as I've sort of said a few times in the in the presentation there, uh, the underground uh, the underground piping network is the key component to geo exchange systems. Um, and to install that in a current home, um, likely you're going to have to, uh, we're going to have to drill and excavate within um, either your driveway, front yard or backyard. Now, if you don't have a ton of landscaping or if you have a larger lot, then it is very, very easy for us to do. Uh, but then you do have to excavate, uh, bury all that piping. Find a way to pour into your home because the heat pump needs to uh, sit inside your home. Uh, we need to find some square footage within your home as well and connect to your current distribution system. So it's a little more complicated. And that's kind of why I said 90% of what we do is new construction. There is the ability to retrofit. There are rebates um, to leave your gas furnace behind and, and, and move over to a geothermal system. You can get an energy audit done um, and confirm that. But the construction process is a little pricey, unfortunately. Um, there's really no two ways around that. Um, if you are really looking to electrify your systems, um, air source heat pumps are a happy medium where you're going to be using an electric heat pump, uh, but also uh, not having to sort of tear up your, your beautiful landscaping or anything like that. So um, one thing I didn't touch base on too, too much is um, 
Geotility, we are a mechanical contractor, so we do air source heat pumps as well. And um, within the Okanagan, uh, we try not to market it, but um, we do gas furnaces. So we are sort of a sustainable community or a community leader first. But since we are a mechanical contractor, we do have the ability to put in new gas furnaces, which are much more efficient, um, and then air source heat pumps as well. So now do it yourself DIY. Um, I wouldn't recommend it, I guess, maybe just because I work within the industry. Um, design and engineering is very, very important when it comes to these systems. Um, designing your heat pump for your home is extremely important as well. So I always kind of recommend, unless you have um, personal experience yourself or an engineering background, um, I would always recommend sort of consulting with a professional, unless you are a professional. Um, but there, unless you have your own drill rig, uh, there's there's not really any way to do it yourself. Unfortunately, you can do horizontal piping, but I would always recommend having that sort of engineered and looked at first. Thank you. Um, and uh, someone else says, what outdoor temperature extremes can geothermal system handle to comfortably heat and cool your home? Existing homes are typically not perfectly insulated or sealed, so local climate can have a, a significant influence. They can, yes. Um, so retrofitting a home, you do have to worry about that. What is the envelope of your home like? How are your windows? How are your doors? How is your insulation? Um, the Any sort of heating and cooling of a home can struggle if your envelope is not buttoned up. Um, now, with new construction or sizing of a heat pump is what we specifically look at. So if we were to retrofit a home, we do take that into account and our engineers take that into account. And what you would usually do is maybe upsize or have a redundancy or a safety factor built into your ground loop. And you might upsize your heat pump by half a ton or a ton um, just to ensure it can accommodate those cold, cold winters and those hot, hot summers. Um, BC building code, uh, all of our systems are designed to minimum BC building code, but whenever we go through the design or engineering process uh, with our customers and our homeowners, um, we specifically sit down with each homeowner or each builder. We like to connect with the homeowners if possible, because we want to ask them, do you like your home a little colder in the summers? Do you like your home a little warmer in the winters? If so, if it's past the BC building code, then we would always recommend it does come at a cost, but maybe upsizing by half a ton your heat pump so that you can kind of accommodate that uh, and make sure you're nice and comfortable and you don't have to turn on a fireplace or an electric heater in the wintertime sort of thing. So yeah, hopefully Thank that you. And um, how many boreholes do you need for like a square footage of a home? Like how, how is that done? I, I mean, obviously it's the same thing. If you would like it warmer or cooler, that would probably change things. But on average, how on average, yeah. Yeah, so um, we look at it from our, our ground loops are sized uh, to match the heat pump. So most of the time specifically, we'll do a room by room heat calculation, heat loss. Um, or get the energy modeling if you've already had that done. And then we size the heat pump accordingly. And then the ground loop gets sized for that heat pump to accommodate that. Um, on average, though, generally speaking, a typical townhouse um, would see one to two boreholes uh, in, its, in its sort of driveway area that would be that would consist of the underground piping. So the depth of those boreholes can vary um, anywhere between we like to, it depends on the geology, you know, bedrock, we can drill deeper sands and silts. We don't drill as deep just because we need to drill that hole and insert a unicoil afterwards. So that hole needs to stay open while we put the pipe into the ground. Um, so with sands and silts, we'll, we'll range anywhere from, you know, about 250 feet to 500 feet, dependent on the geology, each bore. And what about waterfront? How, how difficult is that to do waterfront property? Or is yeah, it no, it's um, it's it's a little more difficult because we do have groundwater, which creates a bit of pressure when we're drilling. Um, but waterfront does actually work very well. We've drilled on the beaches of Tofino. Tofino is all propane, um, so uh, if if you have a home, you either are using electric or you're using propane. And not only is propane propane extremely expensive, it's just not a good system. So we've done lots of homes on the beaches of Tofino. Um, waterfront is fine. Um, just to, to take a look at the geologies, the waterfront in the Burrard Inlet or in Kitsilano area of Vancouver, we find sandstone at about 50 feet. Um, in Tofino, it's sort of sands and silts and we keep the boreholes a lot shallower. Um, here in the Okanagan, it can sort of be cobbles and rocks, uh, but waterfront does work. It's just sort of, it's, it's dependent on where the waterfront is, but we have different applications. We have air rotary and mud rotary rigs 
air rotary for drilling into rock and mud rotary for drilling into sands, et cetera. And how resistant to earthquake damage are these kinds of fields? Mm -hmm. So they are very resistant. The HTP pipe is actually a flexible pipe. Um, again, if it's a catastrophic earthquake, most systems will fall apart, um, but they are resistant to earthquakes. It's it's good. It's a great question to ask. Um, the the airport, the YVR airport, who went, they, they've halted it, unfortunately, due to COVID, but they were going through a, a couple billion dollar expansion of their airport. Um, and they wanted to make sure they were sort of ground zero if there was any real natural catastrophes that happened within the lower mainland, um, they decided to install a large geothermal field for that building itself because it is uh, it is a protected flexible pipe within the ground. Now, uh, if it was it hasn't been tried and tested with the the hardest of, of earthquakes, so if something was to happen, it could be damaged. But with your regular earthquake, uh, there have been no issues. Oh, and regular that, earthquake. That's kind of a weird term. But, yeah, you know. no. <laughs> Exactly. Um, does Terrasaurus have to seek permission from BC Utilities Commission for projects like other utilities like Hydro and Fortis, BC Hydro and Fortis? So we do not because we're a smaller utility company. Um, I think, I don't know what the um, the financial size is when you have to start becoming a regulated utility. I think it's 5 million plus. It might be 10 million. Um we do not because we drill um, standalone systems for a majority of our, our infrastructure. So we'll drill, if there's a, a neighborhood of 80 townhomes, each townhome gets its own independent geothermal field. Um, so we are regulated by you know BC Well Drilling, um, the International uh, Geo Exchange um, Association, uh, but we are not a regulated utility by that means because we're not a large scale sort of forest BC hydro type utility. So you set your rates. And then what what happens um, at the end of a, a term or if you sell or stop being the utility, what happens to the homeowners in that situation? So there are there is a master service agreement and a covenant that gets put in place um, from the very beginning. So if for some reason our company was to sell or let's, God forbid, go under, um, there are backup plans put in place so that the utility still runs no matter what. Um, since it is an underground utility that's using the Earth's energy, it would continue to run no matter what. Um, there are redundancies and, and stipulations put in place if someone was to stop paying their bills, just like any other utility um, has those in place as well. So um, there are registrations and service agreements that get put in place. There are pages along with usually the developers, lawyers, and, and our lawyers um, that put a covenant uh, on the lands. That, that document is then... Um, each homeowner, if they were to purchase within one of our communities, gets to go through those documents and the rate structures and what they're agreeing to as well. Um, and the door is always open to, to TerraSource to give us a call before they purchase if they have any questions. Um, it has a 50-year term on it that's automatically renewed, our utility. So it's supposed to last the, the life of the building. Um, and then if there are new home buyers, essentially it just gets transferred to the next home buyer. So as long as they, they read the whatever they're buying into. Um, and again, we're, we're always there. We, we, we meet and speak with a lot of second home, third home buyers, that sort of thing. So a few people are asking about um, putting something like this into an existing home and what the um, approximate economics might be. Um, that's, of course, rather difficult because of the size of the home and the needs of the people and the temperatures of those homes. But do you have a ballpark? I, I, I sort of do. Um, my engineers would kick me in the butt if I gave ballpark figures out. They like us to be as specific as possible. So like you said, it is very, very case dependent. Um, it all depends on the envelope and the heat loss and what kind of distribution systems you have within your home and the geology that your home is within. Um, generally speaking, um, you know, you're, I like to speak in terms of your ground loop is one cost and then your interior heat pump and distribution is a separate cost. Uh, geothermal heat pumps are about the same cost as a, a furnace a, and an air handling unit or an air condenser or an air source heat pump. So our heat pumps are fairly cost neutral with that equipment and the distribution duct work or whatever work needs to be done on, in, on the inside of the home is pretty much cost neutral. Um, the additional cost is that ground loop. 
very generally speaking, um, new construction, the cost of a ground lift is usually about anywhere from three to five dollars a square foot. And that's sort of livable square footage for a home. Um, if you're retrofitting, there are some additional costs and implications um, that that go into installing it. So I like to bump that number up to a comfort wheel, maybe six to seven dollars a square foot. Um, that's a, a very general, very high level um, number. Now, um, fairly accurate. Every estimate that we do, we put in the square footage of the home. So it's pretty close to the square footage. On a lot of multifamily, large scale communities, we can get two to three dollars a square foot. That's your additional ground loop cost. Um, whereas if we're doing a single family, it's kind of the four to five dollar range. And then a retrofit could be six to seven. But uh, there are many variables that go into retrofitting a home. Yes, that would make make sense. Uh, someone's asking, um, we're running out of time. And uh, so we're going over yeah. a little over, um, uh, but people are still on the call. So I'm, I hope that they're interested in what you're saying. I'm fascinated. Um, someone's asking, can geothermal also provide 100% of a house's whole, uh, hot water? It can, yes. It, it can it can supply 100% of the domestic hot water. You do, you do have to increase the size of the ground loop accordingly, um, but hot water is a very it's a very efficient way of heating. Um, like I maybe said in the in the presentation as well, we can heat pools. Now I like to specify that you can supplement the heating for pools because pools are energy suckers. Um, we don't find it very cost efficient to try and do 100 100% of your pool heating with geothermal. You almost have to double. So in some cases, depending on the size of the pool, triple the size of your ground loop. Whereas if you were to install a conventional gas boiler or whatever it may be for your pool, um, that's going to be a more cost-efficient way of doing it. Uh, I, I'm a firm believer that you don't always have to 100% remove gas. Um, reducing gas is just as important and very effective as well. You know, we learned from an early age, reduce, reuse, recycle. So, um, you know, if you create a hybrid system, that's great as well. But you can do 100% of your domestic gas. That's I'll try and be quicker with my responses. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I I think that we can just take um maybe one more question and then we'll maybe send you the questions and you can answer them and we can send them by email. Um, of course. Do you see a demand for retrofits in the Okanagan? Uh, there is a there is a demand. There is a need for it. Um, we have found that the the complications of retrofitting a home. Uh, with geothermal can cause, you know, some financial burden um, where air source heat pumps can be a quicker, um, much more cost effective way to get to that approach. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I recommend looking at both options. Again, my, my door's open. If you guys ever want to contact me, please feel free to do so. Um, you can reach out to Geotility and uh, we like to look at it case by case, but there is a demand, there is a need. Uh, we wish it was utilized more. It's just, it can be costly. So, yeah. Thank you so much, Jimmy. That was really great. Um, so uh, people, if you have any other questions and we'll take the questions that Jimmy didn't have time to answer and we'll send them out to him and send the answers along with the links. I put the link to Geotility in the chat so you can always go to the three little dots down at the bottom of your chat and save that. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I think, you know, I'll thank you so much, Jimmy, for that presentation. It was fascinating and inspirational. And uh, very exciting, something to bring to our city councils all around for sure. Yes, if I can touch base on that too, we work with a lot of directors of um, development and city planning. Um, we know uh, the Squamish team very well, the Kimberly team we're getting to know as well. So if there's any opportunity for us to sit in front of the city council, uh, I'd like to spend the time doing so. So uh, any one of you in here, um, if you have the ability, please feel free to uh, provide some invites and, and I can help assist in any way because um, there is a tipping point for this technology. It's really starting to um, to build, uh, starting to grow, uh, not only in the United States, but uh, here in Western Canada. Um, lots of good yeah. jobs. Lots yeah. of good jobs, right? Yeah. So city council, um, yeah. any sort of questions you have, please just reach out. We're, we're always here. Thanks so much. I'm going to pass it over to Sue to wind us up. And uh, Wanda, take us away. Thank you, Laurie. And thanks so much, Jimmy. I, it's just great to know that a company of your size and everything that you do is just up the road in Kelowna from where we live. 
Um, I'll just very quickly go over what our next deep dive will be and a few other things. On April 20th, we're having a deep dive. Um, we're hosting it, but the city of Summerland will be running it as one of their Earth Day or Earth Week events. And the topic will be on food security, resilience and sovereignty in the Okanagan Valley and the impacts of climate change. And they'll have three different speakers that evening. For more details and other Earth Week events, you can check out Summerland's website. And I think Lori is going to put that link into the chat as well. Um, as you may know, Earth Day is coming up on Saturday, April 22nd. And there will be a variety of things going on locally in Penticton, Summerland, and Naramata. First things first, we'll have a booth and EVs at both Summerland and Naramata's events. And we'll post details of those on our website and in our upcoming newsletter. So I think that's everything that I can think of. But I just want to thank you again, Jimmy. And maybe we can all just turn on your cameras and we can all give Jimmy a great big round of applause. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. I'm sorry yeah. if I didn't answer all the questions. There's lots of rebate questions that I see as well. So um, again, we're, we, we have in-house engineering. We know the rebates well. So uh, if, if you have questions for your own home or your neighbor's home, just give me a call. Thanks. Wow. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Thank you. Thank Hope you. Hope to see you again next time. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Bye. Spread the word, everyone. Yeah. Will do.